Okay, we're good to go. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'll begin again. Uh, this is John Gregg, mayor of the town of Seabrook Island. Uh, we're convening for a special call meeting of the town council to take up the replacement of emergency ordinance 2020-05. Uh, we have a draft proposed ordinance 2020-06 that we will be considering during this meeting. I ask that anyone that uh, would join this conference call to please put their phones on mute so that whatever they may say and any background noises at their location will not interfere with the ability of other persons on the call to hear the proceedings. We will have the volume on our end turned down so we will not hear anything from anyone else who's on the conference call. And with that, I will uh, call the meeting to order and I'll ask that the town clerk confirm that notice of this meeting has been duly posted and that the other requirements of the South Carolina Freedom of Information Act have been satisfied. It has. Thank you for that. We have one item on the agenda for our special call meeting that is, as I indicated, for persons on the conference call, the consideration of a proposed emergency ordinance 2020-06. This is an emergency ordinance to modify and extend the requirement relating to the work <laughs> face coverings at all business establishments within the town to modify the requirements for certain businesses to extend requirements related to social distancing and group congregations to extend emergency provisions related to town meetings to extend the prohibition on temporary use permits to extend the expiration date for active building permits and other matters related thereto. All members of council should have received a copy of both a marked text version and a clear text version of proposed emergency ordinance 2020-06. Uh, if anyone did not receive it, I believe we, uh, we do have the uh, both versions available as electronic files that you can access from an email that was sent out by Joe. Uh, at this point, I will call for a motion for approval of the of emergency ordinance 2020-08 as presented. So moved. Is there a second? So I'm gonna second and then we open it up for discussion, right? That's correct. Okay, second. And now I will begin. I, I think, Joe, with Pat on our Zoom call, that it may be appropriate to skip forward into the substance of our discussion to address the continuation of the existing prohibition on, ex on issuance of temporary use permits. Do you think that's appropriate? Uh, yeah, however you would prefer to do it is fine. So I would like to take that up. Uh, we have also been provided the temporary use permit application that has been submitted for the uh, Kiowa Seabrook Exchange Club uh, 5K and half marathon events, which are scheduled for, I believe that was November 21st, 2020. All members of council should have received a copy of the application. Does, does everyone have that application? For, for yes. Yeah. 
Very good. Um, I, I acknowledge that the application has extensive uh, description of precautions that are being taken with respect to the conduct of the two uh, races, the 5K and the half marathon. And the really the only question I have concerning the event is, is there any estimate? I believe the estimate was that there would be about 150 participants, but I wonder whether there's any estimate of the number of people that might be expected to attend at the start and or finish of the race. Pat, do you have anything to uh, contribute in that regard? Well, you know, we've done this thing for quite quite a number of years. And uh, I guess one of the, the only complaint we ever get is that there's not any spectators on the course. Generally, if you run in a big run like the Turkey Day or the Marine Corps Marathon, you know, you got as many spectators as you do runners. But being that, that Seabrook's a private island and Bohiga doesn't lend itself well to spectators being on the sidelines, generally the, the people that we will have at the run, I would say 95% of them are runners and the rest of them are volunteers. So, and, and we have about a 30-70 split. We'll have about 30% of the participants will run to 5K, which is simply an in and out um, of the island and the half marathon is the same course that we've had in the past where they'll go down by the beach club. They make one great big circle through the island and back out. Um, I would say that probably we could end up with uh, 170 and a half and maybe 80 or 90 in the, uh, in the 5K. And, and as I put in the protocols, uh, you know, we, we're going to practice safety from the time they step out of the car. We will have uh, temperature guns in the hands of our volunteers at the parking lots. So if anyone's temperature is at any indication that they may have a fever, they'll be stopped at the parking lot and given an uh, uh, email address where they can request a refund or deferment till next year. So there, there should be no intermingling of anyone, even if they have a ch chance of having the virus. Um, we have, the, the road is gonna be divided. Now, if I get too much into weeds with the details, please stop me. Well, Pat, but, I, you know, I appreciate the description of the various protocols for conduct of the race from start to finish. I know that you have laid out uh, how you will do the testing and the, re the wearing of uh, wristbands and so forth. And I know that there's, for purposes of starting, you've uh, defined a, a starting, I'll call it a grid, so that the participants, you'll do groups of participants and in each group participants in the, whichever event it is, will be spaced from others by six feet. Correct. I think that's essentially six feet in all directions. But in any case, what I was really trying to understand better, I have not attended these in the past. Uh, I know nothing about how the races are conducted other than what I've seen in, in the material you presented, but I'm, I'm really more interested in knowing what magnitude of crowd is attracted for the start and the finish that may be at the marina who are people who are not participants? I, I would say very minimal. Um, very, very few people will drive down just to observe. Uh, you may have a husband wife that comes down and the husband runs the 5k and the wife runs the half marathon or vice, vice versa. But I experienced over the last eight or 10 years is that we have very, very few uh, observers. You know, the, the observers are generally the volunteers <laughs> and the Charleston Running Club uh, members and perhaps some of the merchants when they, if they come in before the race is over. 
but um, it doesn't draw large crowds. It, it just, this event, if it were held in Charleston, it possibly would, but the distance of driving to Kiowa and Seabrook is just too far. So we have very, the answer to your question is, uh, the people at the marina will be the runners and the volunteers. All right, I appreciate that, Pat. And uh, what I would like to do now is uh, allow the other members of council to ask any questions they may have for Pat. Uh, the, the point of this exercise is that the proposed ordinance, as I, I think I already stated, will continue the prohibition on issuance of temporary use permits. And the result of that would be that, that at least as my understanding that the, the pending temporary use permit for this event had not been approved. If it had been approved, then that would have been revoked. That approval would have been revoked under our former emergency ordinance. But under the, my understanding that it has not been approved, then the continuation of the prohibition on issuance of temporary use permits will mean that this application will be denied. And I think and we don't want to take up Pat's entire day while we decide what we want to do about it. But uh, I want to give all the members of council an opportunity to make it. So uh, skip. I'm going to try to go alphabetically, and I, I know I've I know I've gotten this wrong recently. But skip, I still think you would be the first in line alphabetically speaking. I, I think so. Uh, I, I have a few questions uh, for Pat that are basically uh, number or data in in uh, uh, in meeting. I guess how many how many runners do you anticipate total in the day? Last year, last year we had three hundred and thirteen. Okay, I yeah. I think that that's to me a big determinant with the if I read through the permit about the plan for refreshments afterward. Uh, yeah, and as far as in the past, um, we have, uh, have you ever been to the run afterwards? I have not. Okay. We, we, we put out banquet tables in the uh, square in the patio where the flagpole is, and, and, and it was almost like a buffet. They would just come by and pick up a banana, or pick up an orange, or a, a whatever drink that they were gonna have, and they would sit at the tables that, that the marina has and at the tables that the salty dog has and the benches on the boardwalk. And um, that, what we're trying to do is say, no, we don't even want that inter interjection. We'll have double tables with all pre-wrapped food. In other words, generally when they finish, runners are looking for Gatorade and maybe an energy bar or banana or something like that. So we right. won't have raw food uh, there'll be double tables so that our volunteers and staff at the marina will be six foot from anyone on the other side of the double tables and the participants will finish the race and they'll walk through to the patio get their gatorade or get their banana and continue walking they go back to their car they can go down the boardwalk but there will be no conjugation of of people in one central place and, uh, how many what, how many people do you anticipate being getting their post race food, whatever it might be, at one time? My my whole concern on this line of of questioning is uh, relative to social distancing and making sure we can maintain that. Absolutely. Um, one good thing is we do have two runs, so the five k run generally is over uh, anywhere from the very fast runners finishing about fifteen minutes. And the very slow ones finish in about 45 minutes. The fastest half marathon runner will be an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes. So the 5K runners will go out, come back, and be finished and, and virtually gone before the half, marath um, half marathon runners come back to the marina. So by virtue of that happening, we've gotten rid of 30 to 40% of the participants uh, we've, we've segregated him out and got him out of the way before the other ones come in. 
So you're you think you're straggling out the finishers sufficiently that uh, uh, the after food is not going to turn into a social event, so to speak. No, and we will have staff and volunteers from the running club to stop that. Uh, and the nice thing about the half marathon is, uh, I don't know if you observe them on the island, but we have all ages, shapes, and sizes. And the fast ones are in and out, and the slow ones, you know, we give them until I think 11 to be off the island. And I think some of them push that, you know, push that time cut off. Okay. So they, they'll be trailing into the marina. That's a, a good segue into my next uh, question or two. Um, I think I read in the application that uh, the groups as, as corrals and there are uh, you, 50 runners in each grouping. Yes. Is that right? Uh, and you, right? Yeah, and you're... How do we... You, how do we determine your screen who froze. is in? I'm sorry. How do we determine who is in what corral? And what the reason I'm asking is that, that is, I don't want our slower participants, participants that take longer to complete this particular race, whichever one it might be, are they mixed in with those that are likely to finish in, in the top time category? And therefore, there might be some, I don't know, overlap of, of people out there, tougher spacing while the race is happening itself. Right. Now, the instruction will be, and, and one of the things, if, if someone were to come in the prior years and run the fastest race in the state, then they would, they would get, a, they could break a state record. But this, unbelievably, the, the official times must be a gun time you would think that the official times would be the chip time because they're exact, but it's not. And so the faster runners will be in the first corral out up front. And we're going to, and, and, you know, we pretty much know the faster runners because when, when they submit uh, their application, uh, they're 75% of them are known to the, com the running community. And, and I've already had discussions with a half a dozen of them. Uh, they're concerned that they, can't go by gun time, that they're going by chip time. But what will happen is those faster runners will be in the first corral. So and it does use a handicapping system if you want to use it that way. Um, kind of a, yes. Okay, that's good. I think uh, that's all I have, Pat. All right, thank you. John, that's all I have. All right, thank you, Skip. Uh, Jerry, I'm, I'm going to try again to follow alphabetical order. So. As okay. near as I can tell, that would be your next. Okay. I have a couple, three questions and comments. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the CDC, DHEC, and NIH sites the last couple of days. And I will say, I, was, I understand why gators are being handed out in their bags instead of masks. But, you know, I will comment that an like the CDC site says, the effectiveness of gators is still under consideration and research about how effective they are because they fit so loosely. So I was kind of disappointed that it's gators and not a mask, but I understand being able to pull it up and down while you're running. So I will make that comment. My second thing is, I think you did a really good job of, of planning this out for safety but my question is, or I guess observation is, people are so nonchalant about this. You guys could have all the rules and these procedures set out, but are the runners gonna follow them? And so how do we enforce to make sure when they're in the crowd before they're running that they have those gaiters pulled up or their mask on? I mean, do we need to plan ahead and have an enforcement officer there, Joe? I mean. My problem is we say, go ahead with this and, oh, here's all this great planning, but nobody has their mask on. They, uh, Jerry, they, they won't be allowed in the corral without the gator and or the mask. Uh, they will not be allowed basically to participate. And the, the running club will have probably 15 to 20 volunteers We'll have eight or 10 
marina employees. We'll have a Charleston County uh, police officer that we always have, and we'll have some medical personnel, but no one will be allowed in the corral without a mask and or the gator. Uh, the reason I, I chose a gator, now we will have, I don't know if I put it in my protocols, we will have hand sanitizers and masks everywhere. We'll have them at the pack, pack and pick up. We'll have them right beside the, the uh, corrals before they start. And the reason I chose the gator is because yeah, I, people- I, think, I, think your protocol, I know you can pull it up and down real easy. Yeah, and, and, and I was afraid that if they t- had the mask, as soon as they got on Seabrook, they'd be pulling the mask off and throwing it, you know, on the side of the road. And uh, if they want to wear a mask, we're certainly not going to prevent that. But they will have to have the gator around their neck to get in that corral. And if they don't, yeah. we, will, we will pull them out. And, you know, good thing is you guys control Seabrook and we, can control, and we control the marina. And it's private property, both places, basically. And, and we have every right to ask the officer to remove somebody. But yeah, I know the running community and you, we're just not gonna have that. These are very well disciplined people. Okay, and I guess my other comment is, w- would you go back to handing out this food? Because under the governor's directive, you can't have a cafeteria buffet style. The staff has to actually hand the food. So is that how you plan on doing it? There'll be staff person there to hand them the banana or so people yeah. are. Yes, we, cause I, at first we were gonna allow them to pick it up and I said, well, somebody comes and picks up a banana and decides I want a banana. He wants a uh, energy bar and they put the banana down and pick up the energy bar. And so what we'll do is we'll have staff and the food on one table and it'll be then a blank table on the other side and they'll point or request what they want. And our staff will have gloves on, they'll have uh, mask or gators on, and they'll hand it to the participant. Okay. They change their mind, they can discard it, but they can't bring it back. Okay, I mean, that is what you have to do under the governor's directive. So I just right. want to verify that. Um, that's all I had to ask or comment on. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Pat, I'm, I'm still trying to follow alphabetically. So you are next. Um, Pat, I think you did an, you and your group did an excellent job of putting together <clears throat> these safety measures and this proposal. And um, I you. think my que- my questions have been addressed already by the questions that came up earlier. So um, I just commend you on doing a very good job of organizing this. Thank you. Well, we want it, we want it to be safe and we want, you know, we have, we sent out a survey monkey after the race each year. And Bohica is one of the highest uh, uh, rated races to, you know, can people rave about Seabrook and the, uh, and the surroundings. I mean, you just can't beat it. And so we generally give them more than they ask for. Very good, thank you. And uh, Barry, alphabetically, it's to you now. <clears throat> So I read the protocols. I think they're they're well written. I think you've got a good understanding of what you need to do. So I guess really the burden just falls on you to make sure you have enough volunteers and enough people that are going to enforce all of your protocols. And you should be should be good. I, I think it's just a matter now of uh, making sure that uh, people follow the protocols, which would be up to you guys to make sure that happens. Well, we I can guarantee you we will. We. Uh, uh, the, the South Carolina um, Commerce Department and DHEC have approved 21 different runs in Charleston in South Carolina between August and December. And, and uh, I think, well, I know from what I've read, I've read each one of the applications, we have more protocols in place to control the crowd and, and make sure that it is safe than, than any of the other 20. Um, you know, that governor's executive order, it says that some of the exceptions are that people engage in strenuous exercise. And um, I, think, I think that's definitely what we're doing. Um, they do have a, a, what they call a cocoa cup run up in, uh, in up by the, uh, Highway, it's, it's up by 26 in Highway 17A, 
and, and they've got 2,000 participants. And you know, I shudder to think that they would try to control that. And then they got another one about two weeks later that um, Thanksgiving Day just got 800 participants. And they don't have anywhere near the protocols that, that we have. So I, I can assure you that we're not going to embarrass the town. And, uh, you know, this is one of the largest events for the Exchange Club and the, and the, and the foundation. Uh, and, you know, we, we're just at our core, we want to have the best run that, that, can, that, that, that we can have. And we want a reputation of having a run that was totally safe. All right, thank you, Pat. Joe, uh, do you have any questions for Pat? Uh, the, have you talked with anyone at Kiowa? I believe they had canceled their race in December. Yeah, they, they do it, but I think they're doing a virtual. Do you know okay. what contributed to the decision not to hold it? I just don't, I don't know because I haven't talked to them, but I think one of the problems is that the, is the crowd that they have several thousand people and controlling that crowd in the, I've ran that race before. And uh, it, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a situation where we, we can control people. We, we've got them in, in one Marina uh, in the roads and, you know, Q was kind of more spread out, especially at the end. Uh, they're all over that island and in, in, uh, Night Heron and wherever they end up this year. Well, would have ended up this year. Uh, I would guess it's a control feature. One, one other question is um, this race will be taking place at um, a location where other business will be uh, conducted. So customers coming and going. Um, will you, uh, you have a, a pretty extensive list of protocols for those uh, participating in the race? What about keeping people who are going to uh, patronize any of the other businesses at the marina um, while this event is taking place? In the past, most people are gone before the shops open. And, and, and each individual shop is, is required to follow Seabrook's um, requirements for social distancing, mask, and, and all that will still be in place. So if there's a dozen people lingering after the race is completely over and we've cleaned up, we've gone, they still would be under the same requirements as they would be today if they went to Bohinkin Marina. Any shop that they went in, they would have to have the mask and they'd maintain the social distancing. And so I, I don't, we've never had an issue with the merchants um, and, and their customers because we start way before they open and 80% and of what we do is gone before they turn the first door lock open. Okay. That was all I had. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe, it, it, what I, I would draw, the conclusion I would draw is there is at least interest from members of council in allowing this uh, event to go forward so that we would need to uh, accommodate approval of the application under this emergency ordinance. And of course, the, the emergency ordinance as prepared essentially extends the current prohibition on issuance of temporary use permits. So what I'm getting to is uh, what would you propose to allow council to uh, permit this event to proceed? Uh, I think you'd have to amend a, a couple sections. One of them would be uh, section seven. Which, can you see that on the screen? Well, we're not at section, section seven. I do see the, I, I see the ordinance on the screen. Now you're at it, but you have to go down one page more. Okay. 
So under under section seven, that's where you um, and the draft ordinance um, continued the uh, uh, it, at least as far as the draft goes, it continues the um, uh, existing emergency provisions for temporary use permits. So um, basically, it's just extending it out for another sixty days. Uh, what we have in place now, uh, and those two requirements are all temporary use permits for events and activities taking place between. October 22nd and December 22nd are uh, repealed. Uh, I, I don't believe we have any permitted. I, I've had this one for a while, but we uh, had set it aside um, because uh, for pretty much all the time since we received it, these uh, provisions have been in place. Um, and the second one is the zoning administrator shall not issue any new temporary use permits for events or activities taking place between those same dates. So if if council is is wanting to allow uh, temporary use permits, uh, and again, when you do it, you're not just doing it for one, you're amending the ordinance to allow you know, any temporary use permit uh, to apply. Um, so I mean, that's something you may, you may wanna take into consideration, you know, you may be happy with the protocols put in place for this one. You know, others may come in and you may not like those as well. But, you know, when we open the door, the door is open uh, for other types of uh, events and activities. And then I think the other thing we would have to go in and revise um, when we looked at the uh, draft ordinance last time back in August had a language that was in um, governor's executive order um, 50 and what council decided to do uh, was basically to, to maintain uh, the prohibition of group congregations with more than 10 people. Um, so I think if you're going to allow, you know, a large type activity, um, you know, like this or other types of activities to take place, then we uh, then we would need to go and and basically just pull that provision out, um, I think, and just go with um, what the governor has in in the current executive order. Um, so I, I think if you wanted to allow uh, those types of activities, we would need to amend section five uh, to remove the prohibition on group congregations with more than ten people, and then also in uh, section seven uh, to. Uh, once again, allow the issuance of temporary use permits. So, for example, if I followed your 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 logic there, Joe, and I think I did, uh, the Billfish Tournament people can come back and say, "Hey, we've resubmitted our protocols, which you didn't like before. Please take another look." That's yeah, we. We had one of our one of our emergency ordinances during the spring or early summer. Um, we had council had approved amending the provision to say that uh, the zoning administrator could issue uh, temporary use permits, uh, and I forget the exact language, but it was as long as you know protections were put in place and mm -hmm. social distancing was required and whatnot. And while that ordinance was into effect, we had received one application. And that application ended up getting denied by council. Um, so when the ordinance was last updated in um, uh, in August, we we basically just took that out and said, okay, we're just going to go back and um, not allow temporary use permits. Um, really, based on the fact that the only one that had been submitted, uh, council was not comfortable with, you know, the group congregations and the activity. And you know that one is probably even, I would say, a little less of a risk than this one. Um, you know that one, the people were primarily going to be uh, out on boats during the activity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, among them, family, you know, members, friends, whatever. Um, you know, so you would never really have that large congregation, you know, before or after the event. Um, everything was going to be spaced out, you know, with the, the weigh-ins and all the other activities. The award ceremony was going to be virtual. Um, so, I, I mean, just comparing the two, this one seems to be 
more people, more interaction. Uh, and I know that was a, a concern that council had when the billfish tournament was denied uh, a few months ago. So, uh, but to, to answer your question, yes, if the, if the emergency ordinance is amended and we remove the prohibition on groups larger than 10, then at least theoretically, you know, we could start having the large groups congregating, you know, not just for temporary events, but on the beach, you know, large gatherings and those type things um, on the beach and in other locations. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, you know, potentially you may have additional um, temporary use permits that may come in. The way the, the, way the DSO is worded, um, the reason why you had to look at the um, the billfish one and, and why this one specifically isn't before you with a request to approve or not approve the permit is because the DSO says <laughs> if a, um, a temporary use permit is for, I think, three days or less or under three, then it's a zoning administrator review and approval. Uh, the billfish tournament was longer than that threshold. So that one actually had to go to council um, for review uh, and a vote. Um, so, you know, when you have shorter events like that, it doesn't necessarily mean that council would even see them um, unless you put that in the emergency ordinance that they had to have, um, you know, some uh, approval from council, regardless of the length of the event. So can I ask a question? Or make a comment here. Is that the only way we can do it, Joe? Because I'm not going to support removing our group limit or just totally allowing anything to start happening. If we can draft it so we're looking at this one with really strict protocols and some assurances from Pat that everything's going to be enforced, then I could think about voting for it. But we're talking about a month from now, or a couple, three weeks from now, when who knows what's going to happen with, you know, COVID and the rate, we're already hovering around a 12, 13% positivity rate. So I am not going to support this if the only way we can do it is remove those provisions from the emergency ordinance. So it seems to me that it's at section five, the prohibition on groups of more than 10 could be amended to accept the groups that are a result of an event that has been approved. Yeah, I mean, you can expand the, the list of uh, exceptions for when that would not apply. Um, I think you just have to have have uh, uh, a rational basis for why you would allow one group to congregate but not another. Hey, can I interject? Alphabetically, Paul, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it seems to me, you know, I, I, I lived over in Kiowa for 20 years and actually was started that town when I was a baby. Um, but it seems to me that, that you could have either an exception that, that it requires approval by council or, or requires approval from zoning or the administrator without opening up too much of a door. Uh, you can still have your regulations. I mean, even the governor's executive order, the second, the second paragraph has exceptions. Um, and, you know, I, if I were sitting in your seat, I'd feel the same way. You, you wouldn't dare want to approve this or any event that opens up the floodgates, but if you still maintain the discretion to, to evaluate the applications and depending on the quality of the uh, protocols, you should have a right to turn it down or pass it. I can't imagine we get that many of them, but that way you wouldn't lose control, but you would do, the ordinance would allow you to, to uh, vote on an exception if it had the proper protocols. Any other questions or comments for Joe? Hearing none? At this point, Joe, I think uh, it would be 
appropriate to put together some amendment of this ordinance for members of council to have a look at. Please. I, I'm sorry, Skip, what did you say? Please. Yes. I'd like to see an amendment that there's, as Pat just outlined, that, you know, the section doesn't apply. Yes. Jerry, you just cut out. And a pre council. Jerry, you're, you cut out. You cut out. I'll try again. I would support an amendment that allows an exemption under Section 7 for events that have been presented to council with proper safety, health and safety protocols and approved by council. Yeah, I wouldn't, of course, I wouldn't choose the word proper. I think the importance here is that it would be, the, the, the concern is that we don't, as, as stated, we don't want to gut the prohibition on gatherings of groups of 10 or more. On the other hand, if we have, if we are able to exercise oversight of a particular event so that we're controlling a particular congregation, I, I don't see that we would then be gutting section five. It's a, it's a question of bringing to four, bringing to the four that you have the ability to regulate things that for which you have you are exercising oversight that weighs up what the risks are for public health and safety. And certainly when I say proper protocols, I mean protocols that follow CDC and DHEC guidelines. Yeah. But I, I really feel that the council needs to see something to address what, what I perceive at least as a willingness of council to allow this event to go forward. Now, if, if I'm misreading council, we can just stop this discussion and uh, not take up Joe's time trying to work out an amendment. Yeah, Anyone? I just pulled up the language that we had from, uh, it was the second emergency ordinance that was adopted back on May 26th. And um, so we had, kind of crafted a narrow uh, exception where temporary use permits could be approved. Uh, and that one said the zoning ad administrator shall not issue any new temporary use permits um, for events or activities, except for events that the zoning administrator determines can be held with adherence to social distancing practices and without the congregation of large groups so as to minimize the spread of COVID-19 within the town. Um, you know, I would say we, we could probably take something similar uh, and then just any temporary use permit, uh, if council wants to review and approve each one, uh, we could just substitute council for the zoning administrator. Um, but, you know, we'd probably use language substantially similar to this. And just change the dates. I think the trick here was that you, you are contemplating in some sense a group of more than 10 people and that still requires that section five allow that exception yeah no we would we would put a, an additional sentence or clause on section 5a um you know, where it says this requirement shall not apply to groups while engaged in performance of their work um, or when they conflict, directly conflict with an order of the governor. And we could just add, uh, or for special events or, or for temporary, or for congregations related to temporary use permits, uh, which are duly authorized uh, pursuant to section seven of this ordinance, and then seven would outline the process. That works for me. 
Anyone mm -hmm. else? It works for me as long as we're approving all of them, yeah. Skip, works for me. It works for me, but I have one other question. Yep. Um, section one, um, part C, I guess we call it, with the exemption for masks, we removed the sentence from the governor that said a person who is engaged in an strenuous exercise or physical activity. So would we need to put that back in in order to make this race legitimate within the town? Or does the governor supersede what the town? No, the governor doesn't supersede us. So we would need to put that sentence uh, back in. That, that provision, if you're in section one, that's when you're uh, inside of a business establishment. So if someone was going inside, they would certainly have to wear a mask. But um, if they were outside of a business establishment or, um, you know, they, they wouldn't have to wear one. Um, the, okay. the context of that section is when you're in, uh, inside a business or waiting for a business. Okay. Or waiting, okay. Anything further, Pat? Uh, no. Anything further, Barry? Nothing. All right. Uh, Mr. Welch. Yes, yes sir. Uh, council has uh, arrived at how they want to proceed. So I believe uh, you need not stay on the Zoom and you can go do worthwhile things with the rest of your day. <laughs> well, I can assure you this is the, probably the most worthwhile thing I did today. <laughs> and I really appreciate the time that you guys have devoted to it and ladies. Um, it, it, it makes a, a, a big deal. It's a big deal for us. The marina doesn't make any money at all. In fact, we, we contribute all our staff and, and everything you see at the marina has contributed. It's just that uh, this is a really good cause and it gives us an opportunity to show that we can put on a good race and have a safe race. And I uh, can't thank you enough for considering it. What, thank you. What I, would, what, what I would recommend we do, because um, you know, right now we're just looking at uh, the ordinance itself. We do have a council meeting next Tuesday. Um, you know, if we finalize that language for uh, this emergency ordinance and get it adopted today, uh, and we put in language that says, um, Temporary use permits have to go before town council. We can do that on uh, on Tuesday of next week. Right. And there right. will be time then to process the application. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I, I have held off ordering our awards and, and shirts and some of the most expensive items until you had a chance to consider it. So I'll wait till, until after your Tuesday meeting and, and then we'll pull the trigger if it's approved. We're not too far away from the Tuesday meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate your time. Any other questions? No, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Bye bye. Bye. All right. With uh, having relieved Pat of uh, further attendance. Um, Looking at the, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking through the markup of 2020-06. So without wading through every recitation in the markup, the, the first change that is proposed is an addition at section one, subparagraph A, subparagraph one, to insert the term business establishment shall also include any event or activity which takes place on a temporary basis on or within the premises of a business establishment, including but not limited to a polling place for the conduct of elections and election related activities. Um, the first thing that occurs to me is that I I know that uh, the governor's executive order 2020-63 includes an exception for persons voting 
and those persons who are engaged in administration of an election from a mask requirement. And I, it, it includes uh, encouragement of people to wear masks. Uh, we'll also point out that the recent uh, ordinance, the, the ordinance recently adopted by the town of Keele, which, which I believe is 2020-09.1, includes that same exception. So the reason I bring it up is that in this proposed insertion, it addresses polling places. And I would suggest that uh, I don't, to me, I don't think it's necessary for the town to mandate the wearing of masks at the polling places. So I'm not sure that I understand any other purpose for this insertion other than to be able to stretch the mandate to expressly include voting. Yeah, I, the, this was kind of a follow-up to the discussion when the, the last ordinance was taken up, the last uh, emergency ordinance. Um, the, the governor's order applies only to state buildings. So um, his requirement to wear masks and the exceptions that are attached to that uh, are only uh, applicable to state buildings. They don't apply to uh, local buildings, private buildings, uh, items of that nature. Um, the, the purpose of the request that we submitted to the attorney general uh, after that meeting um, was basically because the, the town uh, has a, a pretty broad definition of a business establishment. Um, and uh, of course the polling place here uh, is at the lake house facility. And under that broad definition from our ordinance, um, the lake house is considered a business establishment. So the reason why we submitted that request to the attorney general was because um, you know, we wanted to verify that um, if, if the town did require masks within all establishments, then it would be enforceable um, on, you know, any activity that would be taking place in that establishment, including uh, specifically uh, an election. Uh, there was a lot of discussion last time. Um, and from my recollection, kind of the consensus of council was that, um, you know, if we had the ability you wanted to require uh, the wearing of masks at the polling place. Um, the opinion that we got back from the attorney general's office, um, it, it did say uh, in their opinion that we, we can uh, have an ordinance and that the ordinance can apply um, to a polling place. Um, a couple uh, caveats with that um, are, are the biggest one that you, you can't station a, a peace officer or law enforcement at the polling place to uh, verify compliance with the ordinance. Um, and also really the only reason a uh, enforcement officer could go in would be on the request of the, uh, I think it was the majority of the poll managers can request um, uh, an enforcement officer to go in and and they use the phrase several times in, in the advisory opinion to restore order. Now, what it actually means to restore order, that's your guess is as good as mine. Um, you know, is it restoring order as in, you know, people being required to follow uh, the town's ordinance or is it restoring order if there's someone who doesn't want to wear one and, you know, something happens and, um, you know, they have to go in and respond to that. So um, basically, in short, you can have an ordinance, you can uh, require that a mask be worn, um, but enforcement is um, not as clear cut. Thank you, Joe. I, I think what I want to do, because you have, uh, well, essentially from your comments, you've 
to me, you've confirmed my belief that the reason this insertion is here is so that we are able to mandate the wearing of face coverings for voting. And what I would prefer to do is to poll council and find out if in fact, with having the benefit now of the South Carolina Attorney General opinion, which as Joe pointed out, you, you can read it as saying the municipality has the authority to mandate the wearing of masks, but the management of the polling place is up to the persons that have that responsibility. And the question then comes to mind that if someone were being disruptive because they were told that the town requires them to wear a mask, they would then be in a, the difficult position of trying to quell the disruption. I, I don't see a benefit to the town. And so I would say, I want to hear from members of council about whether or not they feel this insertion is necessary. And I will begin with the members of council in alphabetical order as I remember it. Skip, you are first. So we're looking at section 1A1. One, yep. The insertion. Yeah. The term business establishment shall also include, and it picks up elections. Yep. <clears throat> There is nothing in that that it seems to me, but we're, we're you know, the issue that we might be trying to address is not necessarily the wearing of masks. Yes, it is. But the consequence of people who decide not to, if we say you must. And then we get into that whole discussion you just finished with about what the poll people can do and not do to restore order and what restore order means if, I don't think we can address all those things in this one insertion. No, I think it's just too complicated an issue for me. The, the point is I believe that this insertion has been made to support the mandatory wearing of masks at a polling place. That's why I think it's here. It was, it was really intended to clarify what, what I think was already included in the existing ordinance, that if you are in a location that's a business establishment or waiting in line to enter a business establishment, the ordinance says you have to wear a mask yeah. and and so this is basically saying, you know, that does include uh, a polling place. Now, the, the reason why we got the AG opinion was because there was some concern about, you know, if you require it and someone refuses to do it, um, you know, are you, is the net effect of that disenfranchising uh, someone from their right to vote? Uh, so that, that was the basis for why we got that opinion. But um, I, I thought the, the opinion we got back from uh, the AG was concentrating on what was public versus private property. Uh, that was that was the other question that we submitted. Um, the The primary question was, can the town require the wearing of masks um, at a polling place? Um, the other follow up question was, even if the uh, the town didn't require it. When you have a polling place that that takes place on uh, private property, can the owner of that property um, impose restrictions? You know, non-governmental uh, uh, restrictions. So, if the no, town words, can the POA require it? Yeah, that was the the basis of the question. So, if the town right. said, well, you know, we we don't want to be involved, we'll encourage it, but we're not going to mandate it. You know, if the POA came in and said, well, it's our building and we're not letting anybody in. Uh, who's not wearing a mask? That was basically the the basis of that second question. Okay, so this this insertion is strictly uh, to make sure we've defined a polling place 
as an establishment covered by the, by the ordinance. As a business establishment, yeah. Right, okay. I'm, I'm in favor of that. Sorry to take so long. All right. Jerry. Um, I'm in favor of this language. It's my understanding that during the special election and the primary, SAPOA did require masks. And I think with us requiring masks as town ordinance, we're backing up SAPOA. And everything says the best thing we can do to stop COVID is have people wear masks. Here we're gonna be in November. Jerry? Waiting to vote. So I'm gung ho in support of this. Okay, thank you. Pat? Um, I voted in at the Lake House in several elections since COVID, um, and they do require masks. I didn't see anybody saying they weren't going to go in without a mask because that's their rules. They own that property. So for me, I'm confused. Why, why do we need to say it again? It sounds like it's already been said by Sapoa. Well, the, I think it backs up Sapoa. The the town. That does much. The, the 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 town can mandate the wearing of masks to include while voting. It isn't necessary to do so, but the town can do that. And as I pointed out, both the governor's executive order and the ordinance that Kiowa most recently adopted exempt people from mask wearing requirements while voting or while engaged in administration of an election. So it, it, it is a choice for the town, whether, they, whether the town will mandate requiring the wearing of, ma mandate the wearing of face coverings while voting or not. I realize that, but I'm saying that the, the lake house won't let you in unless you wear a mask. And Pat, I'm just worried, what happens if they change their mind? I'm saying this kind of backs up SAPOA. If, some, if somebody challenged SAPOA or SAPOA changed their mind, here is the fallback. No, wear a mask to stand in line and go in and vote. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't change anything. If SAPOA is going to require a mask, we're just backing them up at this point. Do they need backing up? Well, I think so if they change their mind or anybody challenged them saying, I'm exercising my right to vote, and they can say, well, it's also, town, it's also the law of the town. Put your mask on. I think it's another layer of protection, I guess, is what I'm hearing from Jerry, which I fully support. Uh, that, you know, it's not only what support requires, but the town requires it. Quit giving us a hard time. Put your mask on and vote. I understand I that, but if, that Jerry. if I yeah. understand, yeah, excuse me, but if I understand what the mayor is saying, um, both Kiowa and the state have said it's up to whoever the polling place belongs to, I guess. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the way the Kiowa ordinance is written and the way the governor's executive order is written, they accept from mandatory mask wearing people who are voting or are, who are engaged in the administration of an election, but at the same time, they encourage those people to wear masks. So it's, it's an exception to a mandate. And I, I think having that uh, exception implies, um, you know, would here probably did in Kiowa as well, that 
absent that exception, then a mask would be required when you enter one of those establishments, whether this particular sentence is in the ordinance or not. And the, the reason why I've, why I've put it in is, as we saw with the last one, it's easier to respond to something that's there in front of you in writing uh, and either strike it or amend it than try to craft it on the fly, right. um, really advocating that it be in or, or not in. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think even if, even if this sentence was not in the ordinance, in my opinion, the way the ordinance is crafted, it still would apply. Um, yeah. unless you do what Kiowa did and put an exemption in place. But yeah. this makes it really, really clear to everybody. Show Jerry froze. I said, yeah. I think this makes it really, really clear to everybody. Um. Yeah, I, but I think we're really clear that if you're waiting in line to get in to a business, you wear a mask. If you're inside, you wear a mask. So I, I don't know why we have to say it again. I because guess is where we're, I, what we're doing is we're defining the Sapoa, the lake house, a private property as a business establishment for the purposes of wearing a mask. That's why it's in here. Why don't we just do that and forget about the polling place thing? Well, really, really the intent of it was the, um, I, I think the lake house is definitely a business establishment, but when you get into uh, the operation of the establishment, it talks about, um, you know, employees of the establishment and customers of the establishment. So that, you know, that becomes a little bit more gray because the people working there, I mean, they're, they're poll workers, but they're not employees uh, of the POA or employees of the lake house. So really the intent was to say, if, if you wanted to require masks at a polling place, we're going to, uh, basically what it's saying is, even if there's some other, you know, temporary use or temporary activity taking place, that's not a part of like the daily operation of the lake house. By virtue of it taking place inside the lake house, that activity is still gonna be subject to um, uh, the, the same requirements as the lake house itself. And I, I, I think the current ordinance already says that really this sentence is to, to, to clarify it and remove any question if, if council wants to require mass. I, I honestly don't see any, I don't see a reason to include it. I have no idea. <clears throat> I mean, we've already said it. So why do we have to say no, it again? If you don't see a reason to include it, what's the downside of the clarification? Not, I guess not much. Um, it's a one day thing. And I don't, you know, I've got heavier arguments later on and I have to leave at 3.30. So um, I'll concede this one, but I'm not conceding the others. All right, Pat. So you'll... You're saying you concede it, so you will accept the insertion. I'll accept the insertion. I, I prefer not to be there, but I'm a one person, so here we well, are. Barry? I think the town has an absolute right to do this. I think redundancy and clarification is a good at this point, because at this point, I would hope nobody would want to go in there without a mask, but you want to make sure of that. I'm in favor of this. Okay, you support the insertion. And for me, I do not support the insertion, but my reason for not supporting the insertion is because I do not feel it's necessary for the town to mandate the wearing of masks for conduct of the election. So since my view of this insertion is that it's really in support of that, I do not support the insertion. But can, I, can, can I agree with that? Argument. Can I agree with this? I want to agree. I'm pointing to John on my screen, to the mayor on my screen. I mean, I just don't see the reason for this, but it's, you know, it's three to two, so it's fine, you know? 
All right. So you, you have counted correctly, Pat, and it is the majority support the insertion. So the insertion will be included as it is presented. The next change in the marked version is at section one, subparagraph B, sub subparagraph four. All persons in groups of two or more unrelated individuals while sharing a vehicle, boat, golf cart, or other mode of transportation, which is provided by the business establishment for use on the premises of the business establishment when separation of at least six feet between individuals cannot be maintained. That is, a face covering is required under those circumstances for all persons in groups of two or more unrelated individuals while sharing a vehicle, boat, golf cart, or other mode of transportation, which is provided by the business establishment. So I'm not sure I know how this came about. I believe that the club had some protocol pertaining to uh, use of their golf carts. Beyond that, I don't know of, of other application for this provision. Joe, do you have any, can you fill us in? Yeah, the, this was one that um, Jerry had brought up at our last meeting um, and she talked about there being a, a conflict between a, um, a couple different sections in the ordinance. Um, so this was really another, uh, I guess, policy clarification type one. Um, and really the, the primary driver, no pun intended, of this one um, was uh, the golf carts having uh, unrelated uh, individuals sharing golf carts without uh, maintaining or having the ability to maintain um, social distancing. Uh, but in drafting it, I figured, well, I mean, there, there may be uh, other modes of transportation uh, which may be provided, which, you know, you may have a similar situation. So uh, in drafting it, I included the term vehicle, boat, golf cart, or other mode of transportation. Uh, really the, the key factors on here is that it has to be provided by the establishment for use on the premises of the establishment. So if you are driving your private vehicle uh, with an unrelated person and going and parking at the club, you don't have to wear a mask. Um, but if you are uh, taking a golf cart that's being provided for by the club, for use on the club's property, then a mask would be required uh, if you're not able to maintain six foot separation uh, while you're in that cart. So it's a, a clarification, but um, ultimately it's a, a policy decision whether you would like to insert that or not. Thank you, Joe. I believe uh, that uh, Marina has a, a business that uh, takes people out on a boat. And yes. uh, I don't know what they call that. Maybe they're dolphin watching tours or something. So I would understand this provision would apply to people who are on the boat that are unable to maintain six feet of separation. Is that, is that your understanding? Uh, that's correct. Now, I mean, once they leave the town and they go out on the boat that, you know, our jurisdiction would end, but, um, you know, if they're on the boat and they're anchored at the marina or something, um, then yes, they would be on uh, a boat provided by the establishment uh, and on the premise of the establishment. So that would be required at, at that particular point. Okay. So with that understanding, I will again poll the members to find out whether or not they support this insertion. And I will begin with you, Mr. Crane. Yeah, I support that. Jerry, I think it's up to you next. Um, I, I was the one that brought up the ambiguity in our ordinance um, after the club was unclear if they could require um, 
people to wear masks and golf carts when they when folks were unrelated. Um, so this is Joe's language, though. This is not mine. So um, I don't see any problem with this language. It certainly clears up that ambiguity and, and allows the, the club to cite um, town law. Um, it doesn't, for me, fix the problem. Um, again, as I said earlier, I've spent hours on the CDC, DHEC, and NIH sites, and their bottom line is if you're in public and you cannot social distance, you should have a mask on. So this gets to the golf cart, but it doesn't get to that other major thing that the experts say over the next two months is going to be so important. And, you know, actually they say we're going to be in a culture of mask wearing for the next six to nine months. So it doesn't get to that. Is there a group of people sitting around the fire pit? Are they on a business? They're on the premises of the club, but, you know, should be people wearing a mask. So I don't have any problem with this language. I just think we're not quite getting that wear a mask in public um, in here. But otherwise, I, I don't mind this language. Boat seems kind of like weird, but I would support it the way Joe drafted it, I guess. End of comment for now. All right, Pat. I'm once again, Confused that the club, it's a private organization, uh, can't put on their big boy pants and tell people they have to wear masks in their carts. I, I don't quite understand. I mean, Walmart is totally redoing everything they've ever done uh, for the big <clears throat> after Thanksgiving Day sales. If you go in their parking lots, they're telling people they have to wear masks. Individual companies are stepping up and doing what they need to do. Why can't the club just tell people to do this? Why do we have to put it in some kind of ordinance? I, I just, and now we're including boats. So when you get on a boat and you're gonna go out, you're gonna put the mask on for three minutes and then when it goes off from the dock, you can take your mask off. This is just, I feel like we're just moving into an area and we can't enforce this. I mean, let's get real. We're gonna have people calling us saying they see two people on a golf cart from their back window. I mean, this is just, at first it's unenforceable, but frankly, a club should just say it. Why do we have to say it? So you do not support it. I do not support it, no. Very good, thank you. And uh, Barry? You're next. Well, I, th I think Pat has a, a, a valid point in terms of the club should do it. But at the same time, I do not believe that, I do believe that redundancy and clarification is a good thing. So I am supporting this. You support it. For the record, I do not support it. I agree in principle with the points that Pat raised. I think that if the club wants to require its patrons to wear masks when they get in a golf cart, the club is in a good position to undertake the necessary questioning of the patrons to find out whether or not they're unrelated persons. Clearly, if you're in a golf cart with another person, you're not socially distanced from that person, but you're not obliged to be mask wearers for, for our people who are from your own household. So I do not support this. And, and again, this results in the approval of the proposed insertion by a score of three to two. The next highlighted text, not an addition or an amendment, it's highlighted text because we had a discussion where we have included in, in Emergency Ordinance 2020-05, 
the mandatory wearing of masks of people on the boardwalk and and uh, as we had uh, as it had been indicated in our discussion of this topic it would be a matter of an, a, a proposed amendment and so what i believe i understood was that that pat would have uh would be offering an amendment in this regard so i'll go right to pat well i would like to amend all persons using Seabrook Property Owners Association beach access points, et cetera, be a recommendation. Um, I too have spent a considerable amount of time on the CDC site who recommends over and over, but does not require. And most importantly, if you have a CDC, any tracer, DHEC or CDC calls you and traces you because you've contacted, contracted, COVID-19, they only want to know about people you spent 15 minutes with. So you did And we are crossing you, in a in a in a boardwalk outside. We are not inside. The CDC also even has only recommends with travel. I mean, I I I just don't see how this is protecting anybody, frankly. There's hardly anyone there. Um and it's, most people are outside, they can turn their head. Other people can wear masks, we can recommend it, but I don't see it being, have to being a requirement. Um, and I would like, to, I propose moving it to recommendation instead of required. That's my proposal. Okay, Pat, so essentially what, if you allow me to rephrase this somewhat, Currently we have at B. Um, Going up is B5. Uh, we, we have a recitation that you would like to see eliminated from B and then Move to we D. have a provision D. for uh, encouraging mm -hmm. wearing of face coverings, I believe. We have uh, section 2A. I'm sorry. Yeah, 2A. So yeah. it would mean uh, it, that essentially we would have to craft a recitation for 2A to accommodate uh, the uh, boardwalks. So sure. it would be a deletion from here and an insertion in 2A. That's but, correct. But not the exact same language, obviously. Yeah. Okay, I lost all of you. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I guess we'd have to craft it. No, I mean, I guess I could say while using Seabrook Island Property Owners Association beach access points um, designated as boardwalks one through nine. And by the way, boardwalk eight is gone, um, including um, associated wash stations. So, to me, it would be a fairly simple move yeah, it, from, it, it, from it, required it, it, to encourage. In an earlier ordinance, yes. Yes. Yeah, it's, just, it's just reverting back to the previous emergency ordinance. Um, Before 2020, uh, 2005. Yeah, that's so what I'm five, looking at over here. Yeah, 05 is where it was moved from encouraged to required. And what you'd now be looking at is moving it back from required to uh, Very good, thank you. Um, so having taken Pat out of turn, I will now return to alphabetical order. Skip, what do you say about the proposed change? Uh, the proposed change is moving from section one to section three. Section two. Of, of that one highlighted section. Section two, I'm sorry, section two? Yep. Section two. I'm okay with that. All right, Jerry. Um, as I outlined in the email I sent everybody, I would support that move if 
we move section 2A1 into this section. And I just will comment that yesterday evening, CDC changed their 15 minute guidance to say it's not 15 minutes continuous, it's 15 minutes intermittent over a 24 hour period before your immune system can be compromised. So you don't have to be in contact with someone for a constant 15 minutes. It's intermittent over a 24 hour period and that came out from CDC yesterday. So again, if you look at all everything all those people are saying, when you're in public, if you can't social distance, wear a mask. So I think if that's the language like we use that's already in 2A1, the way Joe train changed it and moved it here, then I'm happy not requiring it on a boardwalk unless you can't social distance. So if we have a super busy weekend and boardwalk one is packed, and people can't social distance going back and forth, you would expect them to put their mask on. But so I would support flipping that. So I guess we have to do that in two different amendments, but if there's some discussion about math, about wearing your mask in public, then I can support Pat's move and reverting back to what we had in our first emergency ordinance. I'm sorry, Gary, I, I'm not sure I understood what you just said. The proposed amendment is to change from mandatory wearing of masks on the boardwalk to encouraging wearing of masks on the boardwalks. That's the proposed amendment. Right, and so can I amend that amendment by saying, as we move that language, we move section 2A1 into this section. Yeah. So it's a two-step amendment. Joe, I'm not sure how we, it seems to me that we have to resolve what we're doing with the amendment on the, on the floor before well, we take up a different amendment. Uh, officially, so what, what we're using is the, the draft that you're looking at is, I guess, the draft of record. So if you want to add or delete something, um, I know the first couple we talked about was just by discussion and consensus. Uh, the majority was of the opinion not to strike it. A motion, a formal motion wasn't made to strike the language um, for what, what Pat just brought up. I believe that was in the form of a formal motion to uh, strike the language from uh, 1B5 and to add it uh, into section 2A. Yes. I don't know if she had a second on that motion or not. If she did, I, I didn't catch it. Well, it, it was not presented as a motion, but let's, let's uh, go through the steps of moving to make that change. Pat, if you will. Okay, I, I move to make that change uh, to move what is in this draft section um, one, I guess, B4 to section 2A and make it number three. 1B5, I think. Yeah, B5. Is it 1B5? Oh, I'm sorry, 1B5 to section two. Okay, is there a second? And I make that motion. Is there a second? I will second. Any discussion, comments? Now, now that you have a motion and a second, it's on the floor. Um, Jerry had mentioned an amendment to that motion. Um, and I believe that amendment was to uh, do what was included in Pat's motion. Uh, but in addition to also move the language from 2A1 uh, into section 1B. Um, if, if the maker and seconder of the motion are okay with that amendment, it can be accepted as a friendly amendment. Uh, if you do not accept the amendment, um, then Jerry's motion would be on the floor. Um, if there is a second, then you would dispose of her uh, amendment first. So you could either accept her amendment or reject her amendment. Uh, if it's accepted, then that becomes what you're voting on. If it's rejected, then you go back to uh, Pat's motion. Okay, so the way you phrased it, 
up to the mover and seconder whether they would accept the proposed amendment that has been presented by Jerry. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So, um, Pat. At this point, no, I, I don't accept that. I, I feel that we, no, I don't accept it. Okay. Yeah, so now, so now I do not accept it. So, if, 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 there, if there's a second to Jerry's motion, then her motion is on the table. We will dispose that before going to Pat's. All right. Is there a second? I second it. Okay. So we are now addressing the proposed amendment to take the language from 2A1 and move it. That is uh, where uh, wearing of face coverings is encouraged and moving it to section 1B where the wearing of face coverings is required or mandatory. Before you vote on that, the first thing you're voting on is uh, whether to accept um, Jerry's, at this point, it wasn't accepted as an amendment, so it would be a, a substitute motion um, to substitute her motion in place of um, Pat's. So the first question you would take up is, do you want to take up Jerry's motion as a substitute for Pat's. You're not actually voting on whether to approve that motion or not. You're voting on whether you want Jerry's motion to become the main motion as a substitute for Pat's motion. And then if that passes, then you vote on Jerry's. If it doesn't, then you vote on Pat's. It should be no surprise to anybody that I have no idea what we're doing right now. <laughs> I, if I followed what you said, Joe, we need to vote to approve treating Jerry's motion as a as the next motion to be uh, approved. You would be voting on whether to substitute her motion in place of Pat's motion. If you say yes, then you vote on Jerry's motion. If you say no, then you would go back and vote on Pat's motion. Okay. But either way, you still have to vote on whichever motion. Oh, 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 no, we just we, we, per on, we can perfect the amendment. And then I think, Joe, I, I move to amend Pat's motion. So we can, we vote on mine, you perfect the amendment, and if mine fails, then Pat's stands as originally moved. And if mine passes, then the vote is on the amended original motion. So the, the order is always perfect the amendment and then the original amendment either as offered or as amended. I think the net result is we're saying the same thing. Okay. So right now it's just a matter of we can debate moving that language or not and, and who supports it and then we vote on it. If it fails, it fails and then Pat's motion is still standing. Um, so I, we, we will, I'll pull the members and skip. What we're discussing is the proposed amendment to move the language from Section 2A1 to Section 1B. So Any what we have encouraged today in item one, we want to require. And up above earlier, what we were requiring, we want to now encourage even though they're separate, they're separate motions and amendments and one's already been taken care of. One's really specific and the other one's very general, but it would remove the requirement to wear a mask on the boardwalk. But if you can't social distance in public, 
in a group, you should have your mask on. Would, but we're taking out it, the specific. Would, would it make it cleaner if you removed your amendment, you vote on Pat's motion, and then you offer a separate motion to move would, A1? It would make it cleaner, but if we're not going to do, if we're not going to move the language, I'm going to vote no on Pat. So I'll vote yes on, on Pat's if we move this other language. So for me, it's hard to say vote on Pat's without knowing what's going to happen to this other language. Okay. So the to summarize, the, the first motion you'll be on is Jerry's motion to amend Pat's motion. So basically is uh, if, you, if you are in favor of moving the boardwalk requirement to being encouraged, but then moving the gatherings of 10 and fewer from encouraged to required, then you would vote yes or in favor of Jerry's motion uh, if you are not in favor of moving um, the, the gatherings of 10 or fewer, um, but you are in favor of moving the boardwalks from required to encouraged, then you would vote against Jerry's motion. Um, and then we would take up Pat's original motion. Yep. You have any further comments or questions? Uh, sitting here just <clears throat> brimming with the anticipated excitement of getting onto our budget stuff. <laughs> to get this going even longer, but let me let me ask you a general question. Something that I don't know if it's in here or not. If I'm out walking, do I have to wear a mask? No. No. Where is that covered? If you're out by yourself, you don't need to wear a mask. All right, what if Lynn and I are out walking together? You live with or no, you don't have to wear a mask. Okay, where is that covered here? I mean, that's just generally, we only are suggesting that you require it when you're in a group of people that you're not related to or don't live with, like at an event and you cannot social distance. That and is real important in there about, and you cannot social distance. Okay. So the, the way it's worded now, um, if you're with, with one or more other people, as long as it's less than 10, uh, and you're not social distancing, so say you're walking with a neighbor, the way the ordinance is worded, it's not required, but you're encouraged to wear a mask if you and your neighbor uh, are going to be within six feet of each other. Um, okay. If you accept Jerry's amendment, then it would actually become required if you and a neighbor were walking with each other and not maintaining social distance. Satisfied, Skip? Yes, I am. All right. So I'm... Jerry, any questions? Any further comments? I don't think so. Pat, any further comments? No. Barry? I don't know if it, 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 we've gotten all convoluted here, but the original ordinance was specific to the boardwalks. And now we're trying to, I guess, get around not having it on the boardwalks. My response is that the you cannot socialize on the boardwalks. I do agree that Pat brought up a point that there's not a lot of use of the boardwalks this time of the year, not a lot. However, given our demographics on this island, given the fact that a lot of older people use the boardwalks, given the fact that you're wearing a mask to protect the other person, given the fact that the virus is spreading, given the fact is that you don't want people to get the virus, I see no reason to change the ordinance. Leaving people to wear a mask for approximately one to two minutes as a courtesy at best to walk down the boardwalk to provide some, some type of protection against your carrying the virus and giving it to someone else, I do not think is that big of a deal. And I think we should leave the ordinance as is. Okay, so 
very, just to be clear, where we have, uh, where we are now in this process is we can approve to move the language from section two A1 to section one B or not. Correct, I'm against that. Okay, you, you do not support doing that? No. Okay, so now I will call for a vote because what was uh, the proposed amendment was to move the text or the provision, I mean to say, of section 2A1 to section 1B. All in favor of making that amendment, please. Well, I, I don't wanna do this this way. I, I will again, poll each member. So Skip, how do you vote? No. Uh, Jerry, how do you vote? Yes. Pat, how do you vote? No. Barry, how do you vote? No. And I vote no. So <laughs> that proposed amendment is defeated, which means that we are now back to the amendment that was proposed, if I understand this correctly, the amendment that was proposed by Pat which would be to move the required wearing of face masks as recited in section 1B5 to section two, where rather than being required, it is encouraged. It won't be the exact same text but the effect will be that the wearing of face masks on the boardwalks will then be encouraged rather than required. So we'll, we'll, I'll just start with <laughs> calling for comments. Skip, any comments on that? No comments. Okay, Jerry. No comment. Pat? Um, no more comments. Barry? No comment. All right, so now I'll call for a vote. Skip, how do you vote on that change? No. Uh, Jerry? No. Pat? Yes. Barry? No. And I vote yes, so the change is defeated. And that means that the wearing of face masks on a boardwalk will continue to be required under section 1B uh, sub 5. I, I, I know I'm not a member of council, obviously, but based on the discussion from the uh, uh, the temporary use permits, um, you may want to add an additional item under 1B uh, to require um, wearing of face masks at all uh, allowed uh, gatherings from an approved temporary use permit uh, that includes more than 10 people. Just to put that in the ordinance as well. I'll make a motion for that of what Joe just said. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we add a requirement for wearing face coverings to section 1B to address gatherings that are approved under temporary use permits where you may have groups of of 10 or more persons, I guess. Is that correct, Jim? That's right. So this would end up being item six under that? I mean, it could be any one of them, but six is the easiest. Oh, it's the next one. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. So, Skip, any comments or questions? None. Jerry? None. Pat? Um, just, to, just to make sure that there's, a, there's not an unintended consequence to this, this is a race. And people will be removing their masks while running. Um, will we be getting phone calls from people saying people are running through the neighborhood, there's four or five of them together and they don't have a mask on? I imagine we will, and I would be happy to volunteer to take those calls. Okay. Yeah, when when it's a, a group, when they leave the premises of where you know the actual congregation is, which in this case will be the marina, um, you know, then I think by the time they get to the gate, I mean, some people run faster, some run slower. They're not all going to come as one in a large group of people they're going to be spread out by the time they get to the gate um, so obviously if you had a group of um, more than 10 people together um, then i would say they would need to wear a mask but if you have a group uh, that's less than 10 um, the the change was not made to move the um, the, the requirement that they wear a mask only to encourage it um, so I would say that um, they would have to wear them while they're at the beginning and ending point where the actual gathering and, and the majority of the, the use is taking place, um, but not while they're uh, out uh, running as long as they're running in groups of less than 10. So Joe, I think that it would be, I don't know if you said this, but I think when you're talking about groups of whether it's 10, under 10 or more than 10, I think that it's important to clarify that within the group, social distancing is not being practiced. That's when they need to wear the mask or gator, right. I think is a gator. Um, so will that be, will that, I'm not, <laughs> okay. I wrote uh, my little notes sort of say, but were very, very short. And it said something about wearing masks, gathering um, under temporary use permits. Um, are, is there going to be more language in there than just that? Or what are you proposing, Joe, as far as the language goes? Are you going to say in groups of less 10 or? When we get to the temporary use, Yes. No, we're down. We're still on, I guess, number six. I just don't want number six to be some sort of. Uh, once again, I'm not really sure why we need number six at all. And as much as when we do a temporary permit, we're basically saying we're overriding some of the things we've already said and we're going to allow this to happen. Yeah, uh, you're really going to address it in both locations because we, because section one is where we require masks. I think if we're going to require masks as uh, a condition for receiving a temporary use permit, then we should put it in section one. And then when we get to section seven, um, we would just say that, um, you know, all temporary use permits shall comply with the mask requirements as specified in section one. Makes sense. But instead of having, instead of having, you know, a mask is required in all these instances, and then we require it somewhere else in section seven, it's, you know, it makes more sense just to put it where we're saying masks are required and then refer to that when we get to section seven. Okay, would you read that to me again then, what it, what it is that you said for number six? So it would be along the lines of uh, all persons participating uh, in an allowed gathering of more than 10 people, um, something along the lines of which is duly authorized by a temporary use permit, uh, issued pursuant to section seven of this ordinance uh, while social distancing is not being practiced. 
something along those lines. Okay, that that's a lot more in. Uh, that's got a lot more meat on it than I think what you first said. So, okay. Well, we, we've refined it over the last few minutes. So. Okay. I've added a couple of notes I didn't have originally. All right. Um, Barry, any questions, comments? No, none. No. All right. So the, uh, pr the uh, proposed amendment is to add a required wearing of face coverings under the circumstances that you, that the <clears throat> persons are within a group, I believe Joe, you said of 10 or more, that is, <clears throat> has been allowed pursuant to a temporary use permit and where the members of the group are not practicing social distancing. Is that accurate? That's correct. All right. That being said, I will call for a vote. All in favor of that proposed amendment, please. Oh no, I'm not doing that. Skip, how do you vote? In favor. Jerry? Yes. Pat? I'll go yes. Barry? Yes. I will vote yes to make it unanimous. All right. Uh, the next proposed amendment is in section one, sub C, sub five, in insertion, person who is obtaining or receiving, these are the exceptions from required wearing a face covering. So it's a person who is obtaining or receiving goods or services that requires access to or visibility of the face, such as the receipt of dental services, or, and the insertion is, or while participating in activity, in an activity where the wearing of a mask is not feasible, such as swimming. Yeah, and all, all that is, I just didn't like the way the sentence was originally worded, um, where it said, if you're obtaining or receiving goods or services that requires access to or visibility of the face, such as receipt of dental services or swimming, swimming is really not a good or service. Okay. So I just threw in a, um, a comma and added, or while participating in an activity where wearing a mask is not feasible such as swimming. All right, it seems to me that this is fairly straightforward. Yeah. So do we have a motion to approve this amendment? I vote. It's, in, it's in the draft, so you don't have to vote on it unless you want yeah. to speak it. Okay. Very good. The <clears throat> It will be approved with approval of the draft as it's been amended today. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, because you had a motion to, to approve the ordinance. So you're approving the ordinance in its original draft form. And the amendments you're taking up are to modify the draft. Right. So if, if you don't want to change it, you don't have to vote on it. OK. So we're uh, now the next change is in uh, section two sub A, sub one, it's a text change. <coughs> that is, people are encouraged to wear face covering in the following circumstances while participating in the loud gatherings. Uh, this uh, clause has been deleted. Uh, gatherings of 10 or fewer persons when separation of at least six feet between gathered individuals who do not occupy a common residence. Mm -hmm. That separation here I have to refer to as social distancing is not being practiced. So the, unfortunately, the, this presents a separation of the recitation concerning what the term social distancing refers to from the recited distance, but in any case, 
I guess, Joe, this is a, a text change that you felt uh, overcame some awkwardness in the text. Yeah, just cleaning up the flow of the sentence. Nothing, not changing any substance of it. All right. And then uh, the next change uh, you have uh, deleted subparagraph three, which have encouraged people to wear face coverings while they're being transported with another person who is not a member of the same household. Is there a reason for the, that deletion? Um, it doesn't have to be deleted. I, when I was working on the language, I was, um, you know, wanting to not. We, when we had the language about the golf carts and whatnot, you know, that was really going to be focused on um, vehicles that are provided by the establishment mm -hmm. for use on the establishment. Um, when you have other language regarding the use of vehicles and whatnot, um, I was what I was trying to do was remove the inconsistency. So when we talk about vehicles and golf carts and other things, it says, you know, in, in section one, that they have to be worn in certain situations. Um, here it says that um, they're encouraged to be worn. So it was really could potentially be a conflict. Um, where you have one says it does and one says it doesn't because a golf cart is technically going to be a vehicle. Um, we just as easily could keep three in uh, and then just add a sentence that um, uh, unless a mask is required uh, pursuant to section 1B4. Either, either one would work. Uh, well, I... I, I took this as being here because people may find themselves using a transport service. And of course we have the local service provider, there are cabs and Ubers and Lyfts. And it's, it, it's not a requirement, it's just an encouragement that if a person is being transported in a vehicle with someone who's not a member of the same household, they're encouraged to wear a face covering. So I, I didn't, you know, it seems to me innocuous enough. Yeah, um, that one, if you wanted to do an amendment, I would just say to uh, restore 2A3 and add at the end, unless the wearing of a mask is required pursuant to section 1B4. Uh, do we have a motion to make that amendment? Because otherwise we would have a conflict between those two. Um, okay. No yeah, one you, to you just presented. I'm sorry. No one moved to make the amendment. <laughs> so there is nothing to vote on. All right. So, so ex excuse me, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, are we keeping this in here or are we taking this out? Right, right three, now it's three right is now being deleted. If you wanted to restore it, um, I would just recommend a motion of, along the lines of to uh, restore 2A3, um, but add to the end of that, unless the wearing of a mask is required um, pursuant to section 1B4. And that's just to remove the conflict where in 1B4 we say in certain types of vehicles you have to wear a mask, but in 2A3 it says in vehicles it's in, encouraged. So just trying to remove the conflict. You can either strike it, which is what I have in the draft, okay. or you can store it and just add that additional language at the end. Okay. So if we, if we, <clears throat> leave it the way it is, we don't have to um, do anything. We just leave it trite, right? Right. Okay. No one made a motion to amend this provision. So the striking would be approved upon approval of the ordinance. That's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I was correct. That's correct. 
Uh, the next uh, changes are in section three, which uh, effectively <clears throat> catch up with uh, emergency, I'm sorry, executive, the governor's executive order 2020-63, which uh, supplants a good deal of his executive order 2020-50. And you will see on page 11 of the ordinance, the, uh, I would say a significant change is the elimination of capacity limitations for restaurants and bars as uh, reflected in the striking of subparagraph four. Also, there were um, mandates in 2020-50, which are now not mandates, and you see those changes in uh, the renumbered subparagraphs four, five, six, seven, and so forth. And the remainder is only renumbering. So, oh, John? Yeah. The uh, changing it to mandate it from the governor is what necessitates our changing the language in the new four through seven from shall to should. Yeah. <clears throat> Just to, uh, like we're doing what the governor is doing, yes. Yeah, we've changed it from a, from a requirement to a recommendation. Yep. So Joe, and, oh, I'm sorry, Skip. No, it, I'm just wondering if the title of section three is still consistent with that. And I guess it is. <clears throat> okay, sorry, Jerry, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, Joe, on number 10 there, where it, uh, yeah, I just lost it on my phone. Uh, number 10, where it says that restaurants should send employees home, is that correct from the governor? Yeah, I believe that's been in there since early um, versions. Um, the ones yes. that the ones that don't have a shell struck out, um, that means should has been in there since the beginning. And I, I think that's tied to um, no, I know some of the, the science has changed a bit, but uh, early on when a lot of the restaurants and whatnot were closing, you know, there was the heck and others were saying, you know, it's not a foodborne illness. It's not uh, presenting a threat to the public. Um, you know, what they may not have understood at the time, well, it may not be a threat to the public, but it's certainly a threat to other uh, employees or you know, restaurant manager or whatever. Um, but that the same language that um, is, is and has been in the governor's order. I guess that just surprises me. I didn't catch it before. Essentially saying restaurants don't have to send home an employee who has symptoms and tested positive. Wow. Just a comment. I had not caught that before in our previous ordinance that that should be a shale, I think. But if, it, if that's what the governor's doing, shame on the governor. That's a long list. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, section four. Yeah. There was one <clears throat> one other shell that was changed to a should. That's yeah. what was nineteen is now eighteen. It's dealing with. Um, uh, refilling beverage cups, changing that from a shale to a should. Twenty reasons not to eat in a restaurant, and that is your choice. Yep. All right. Section four again. This is uh, reflecting the more recent executive order of the government. Other than 2020-5050, it's 2020-63. And of course, the update for the dates concerning sales of alcoholic beverages. Uh, we're just mimicking that language, carrying it over. Uh, the next change 
is in section five sub F. which says this section does not apply to the conduct of official business by or meetings of any agency or department of the state of South Carolina or any political subdivision thereof to include the operation of public schools and higher education institutions and conduct of elections and election related activities. So what we're looking at is the emergency restrictions on gatherings and how they're defined and the uh, exemption, which the highlighted language in the, in the draft is and the conduct of elections and election related activities. Yeah, so that was if, um, if we, um, that language was taken directly from the governor's executive order. So if you wanted to uh, require the wearing of masks at polling places, then I would strike out the highlighted text. Um, if, we were, if we were going to uh, um, not require or just encourage um, the wearing of masks, then we could leave it as is. But um, I guess with the vote being too expressly require the wearing of masks, I would recommend striking the, striking the uh, text that's highlighted in yellow. I'll make that motion to strike that language. Second. Okay. Is that a second, Skip? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, the motion has been made and seconded to strike the highlighted language from section five sub F and the conduct of elections and election related activities in view of the fact that we are by this ordinance going to require the wearing of face coverings at for people who are voting or, or people who are engaged in the administration of an election. Um, do we have any comments or questions? Skip? None. Uh, Jerry? None. Pat? That seems to only make sense, so none. Barry? None. Uh, the motion is seconded. We've had the comments and questions being none. We'll call for approval of the amendment. Skip, how do you vote for do you approve the amendment as proposed? In favor. Jerry? Yes. Pat? Yes. Barry? Yes. And I will vote yes, so that makes it unanimous. If we can circle back to 5A for a second. That's where we were going to, assuming you wanted to allow the temporary use permits again. Uh, this, in the uh, last sentence of 5A, yeah. it says this requirement shall not apply to groups of individuals while engaged in performance of their work or when provisions directly conflict with uh, a governor's order. I would just recommend adding, um, so it would read, this requirement shall not apply to groups of individuals while engaged in the performance of their work um, or while uh, participating in a gathering related to a special event uh, or a temporary use, uh, permitted temporary use or event um, authorized pursuant to section seven of this ordinance. In other words, we said it would be okay. As yeah. long as it's approved by council, right? Yeah. The temporary use permit. All right. Do we have a motion for making that amendment? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any comments or questions concerning the proposed amendment for Section 5A? Uh, Skip? 
None. Jerry? None. Pat? None. Gary? None. Okay, we uh, have a vote for approval of the proposed amendment of Section 5A. Skip? Aye. That's a yes. It is. Jerry? Yes. Pat? Yes. Barry? Yes. And I will vote yes. That makes it unanimous. The proposed amendment of Section 5A as presented is approved. Jerry, do you have anything else? We're five now. Do you have anything else concerning this ordinance? Uh, for section seven, we need to uh, formally amend. Uh, formally amend seven B. Um, and in lieu of the zoning administrator, we would revert to language that we had from a previous emergency ordinance where um, a temporary use permit can be considered. Um, basically, you're looking for the COVID protocols to uh, protect public safety and reduce transmission of the virus. Uh, instead of the zoning administrator, <clears throat> Uh, reviewing and issuing temporary mm -hmm. use permit, that would be a request that would come to council um, and council would have the authority to uh, grant a temporary use permit uh, during that time frame, as long as council believes that uh, the request contains adequate public safety measures. That, that, what, what, which ordinance was that, Joe? Emergency ordinance number? Uh, let me double, give me one second. I want to say it was four, but let me tell you for sure. No, it was uh, 2020 02 adopted May 26th. And what section of the ordinance was that? <clears throat> was section five? Sorry, my computer is being slow. No, sorry, it was not section five. Computer froze. Let me see if I can get it on here. Section six um, B. Six B. All right. Um, Thank you. So it, it would be. Substantially similar to 6B, but not identical. Right. Would... So the uh, suggestion is to amend 2020-06 uh, at section 7B to replace the language in the draft 
with the language from Emergency Ordinance 2020-02, Section 6B, but substituting for the zoning administrator uh, up, uh, where it's, it, it provides that the zoning administrator determines can be held with adherence to social distancing and so forth, that that would be town council determines can be held with adherence to social distancing and so forth. Is that correct, Joe? Yeah, um, I mean, we know it's some of the events won't have, the, won't the, have social distancing and they will have larger congregations. So we'd have to tweak that a little bit. Um, with So it would be some along the lines of with adherence to social distancing practice or the wearing of masks when social distancing uh, is not possible or, um, and we, I would recommend uh, instead of just without the blanket congregation of large groups, uh, the governor's executive order does have a cap of, I believe it's 250. So instead of just using a really undefined large group, we may just want to use um, 250. Up to, is that what you're saying? Up to 250? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, I think the exact language, and, you know, we could just reference what the language was. I want to say it was 50% of the capacity or 250, whichever is less. Capacity of, what, what, the what is the reference to capacity with respect to? The 50% of the location's occupancy limit as determined by the fire marshal, if applicable, or 250 persons, whichever is less. Okay. All right. Uh, do I, we, do we have a motion to make that amendment? Anyone? I'll, I'll, I, I'm on. not quite sure I'm what not the sure I know what I'm, I'm sorry, Jerry. What is it? I, I wasn't quite sure what what, what the wording is. The wording is yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, it would be um, town council may consider requests for temporary use permits for events or activities taking place between October twenty second and December twenty second, and then. Um, <coughs> that if council determines that the event can be held with adherence to social distancing practices or the usage of masks will be required when social distancing cannot be maintained um, and the total size of the group congregation does not exceed 50% um, of the uh, maximum occupancy or 250 persons whenever is less um, and that the applicant would have to provide a, uh, um, a uh, uh, plan or protocols for uh, minimizing um, the risk of the spread of um, COVID. The beginning of your proposed recitation is town council can did you say can consider? May consider. 
may consider approval of a temporary use permit. That's right. Um, Joe, the number, uh, we've just semi-approved or whatever, um, something that is larger than 250, but it, do, it was, <clears throat> they have gotten um, approval from the South Carolina Department of Commerce in conjunction with DHEC. So their group is larger. Um, so do you need some language in there that says if they get approval from the, the South Carolina Department of Commerce? I thought he said 175. No, he said 300 and he 175 was the one type of racer, whatever that was. The, um, <clears throat> well, I thought it was 300 plus last year and 175 this year. 170 people for the half marathon and 80 to 90 for the um, 5K. Okay, then I misheard that one. And then there's the volunteers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's volunteers and other people. So I think we just, we, we, we as a group, if we're approving, we will look at that. And that's why they went and got the approval from um, DHEC and the South Carolina Department of wherever this is of commerce, which was the requirement of the governor. If you were going to have something you had to bigger than 250, you had to have um, approval. Yeah, I, I think probably the easiest thing is instead of trying to spell all that out, um, we would just refer back to um, section 5C, which okay. contains language from the governor's order. So basically yeah. you'd be looking for, you know, a plan or other approvals um, that'll satisfy the um, requirement of governor's yeah. executive order. We don't I think we have to list them all out, right? We can just. Yeah, I, we just, yeah, that, that would be fine with me. I mean, I. <clears throat> So are we still looking for a motion? Yep. Okay, well, with that was what we just discussed, I, I move to bring this up for a vote. In our second. Uh, Skip, any questions or comments? No. Jerry? No additional comments. Pat? Uh, fine. Jerry? Nothing. Uh, at this point, we have a motion to amend section 7B of 2020-06 to allow for town council to consider approval of a temporary use permit and the determination to be made by town council with reference, I believe, to criteria for gatherings as set forth in section five, subsection or subparagraph D, I believe. Um, is that accurate, Joe? Uh, C, um, the general restrictions are in C and then E is where the order references uh, uh, clarification, but I, I think C, uh, 5C is the main one we're looking at. 5C? Correct. Yeah. You're just referring to 5C. This would be in, um, but this is really section 7B, right? Yeah, and, and 5C is really the criteria that you would use in right. considering an application, right? 
But Joe, I thought we just covered this problem in 5C1. It's uh, gathering shall not exceed 50% of the location's occupancy limit or 250, whichever is less. Aren't we over 250? Yeah, that's why I thought there was something in here about. Um, number four. C4, organizers, operators, owners, or hosts of other parties responsible can take reasonable steps to incorporate, implement, and comply with. Um, and limit the exposition. That doesn't exactly say they can get a permit and get approval. Oh, yeah, it's an E. Uh, Is it an E? Yeah. Okay. Organizers may seek clarification regarding the application of the section or exceptions for any particular gathering. So we, we would just refer to uh, uh, 5C to include any exceptions which may be permitted uh, under 5E. And that should cover it. Okay. So refer to 5C to include exceptions under 5E. Right. Does anyone recall whether Pat said they had? I made it. Something from the Department of Commerce? Yeah, and that's E. That's where Joe, it's 5E. Yeah, but did and Pat he, say they have something yes. from the Department of Commerce? Their proposal has that. It's in the very last okay. paragraph about additional information. Okay, good mm -hmm. enough. Anyone else find it interesting that the, that the Department of Commerce is making help? related decisions and not the Department of Health and Environmental Control? He, you know, he, he mentioned DHEC when he said that. In well, the that both Commerce and DHEC. So yeah, it's kind of odd Commerce does it. Maybe they feel like DHEC's a little busy <laughs> and Commerce <laughs> and Commerce had some extra people around so they could, you know, help. <laughs> That's that's like some of the doctor's busy, so the maintenance guy is going to perform the surgery. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's it's public servants. <laughs> they know what they're doing, I guess, sort of. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do we have a motion? Yes, I had made a motion. And it's seconded? I'd already seconded. Yes. Okay. So the discussion is over. I gather. Uh, in favor. Skip. Yes. In favor. Jerry. Yes. Pat. Yes. Barry. Yes. I vote yes. That makes it unanimous. All right. So that addresses section seven. B. Anything further, Joe? Uh, no, just a couple section references changed um, due to renumbering from the last ordinance. But that's it. We're still discussing. Ordinance 2020 06, right? Yes. <laughs> Bill. Yes. You, you missed the whole budget discussion, Sid. <laughs> okay. So, um, Joe, did you say you, you had nothing further or? No, I, you, I, didn't, you I didn't have anything further. No. Paragraph references that you wanted to point out changing. Oh, it was just later on in the ordinance where it, uh, in the previous version, the uh, 
mask requirements were in section two, they're now in section one. So it was just uh, changing the section references, nothing, nothing substantive. All right. Okay. I believe that concludes our consideration of section of emergency ordinance 2020-06. May I have, we have a motion already on the floor for approval and seconded. We've now had the discussion. I will now call for approval of emergency ordinance 2020-06 as has been amended in the course of our discussion. Uh, Skip. I approve. Or nay. Yay. Jerry. Yes. Pat. Yes. Barry. Yes. I vote yes. That makes it unanimous. So the Emergency Ordinance 2020-06 as amended is approved for all purposes. And that I believe was the end of the special call meeting. So we can now proceed to the review and discussion of the draft budget. I am so sorry, but I have to be somewhere at 4.30. Um, Did we reschedule our but this budget workshop to another time? We've already been doing this for two and a half hours, so. Well, three and a half. I'm, I'm willing, I'm willing, but you have a council meeting on Tuesday and then the third workshop, I think, would have been scheduled for Thursday. Thursday. The third workshop would have been scheduled for Thursday, right, Joe? Yeah, we have one uh, next Thursday, um, the 29th. I mean, we we can just push the items from today to the 29th and add an additional one November 5th. I mean, we're not bringing the ordinance for first reading until the 17th. So uh, we, we have time built in if we need to. <laughs> Uh, an extra date. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. I'm willing. Is that uh, satisfactory to all? Yes. We'll, we'll defer our information discussion items to next Thursday. Okay. And we'll add one additional for November 5th. November 5th. Okay. One to three. One until we're done. <laughs> well, the next budget workshop is uh, on October 29th, and then we'll add a budget workshop for November 5th. Yes. And we will take up the items that were on today's agenda for the budget workshop on the October 29th. Was there something more, Joe? No. No? No. No. All right. Uh, having disposed of uh, the budget workshop, I believe it would now be appropriate to for me to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. All of you who had fun today, there's the TSO meeting tomorrow. I'm sure it promises to be equally exciting. Okay. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.